Praise the Lord and welcome to Empowered by the Word here at the Apostolic Church of God. Can we give God a hand clap of praise? I know it's raining outside, but this is the day that the Lord has made and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. And while you're giving God praise, can we thank God for our pastor, Dr. Byron Brazier, as well uh, as our First Lady Evangelist, Mary Brazier. Uh, and I'm so glad those of you on Facebook don't beat me up. We weren't able to have you all pulled in, but I see Brenda and Anna and all of you are normally called Donna, Wanda. Uh, and so it's good to see the Facebook people back in my list of names. Uh, so please don't be mad at me. We were having technical challenges with our Facebook team, uh, but we are back up and running and I'm excited about today's Bible study. I hope y'all don't get me in trouble and tear the church up because I am not responsible. So this is my disclaimer to the pastor that if they act up, that ain't on me, that's on the Lord. So hold all them responsible for their behavior. But uh, the Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So if you're hungry for the word, somebody shout, let's eat. Father, we come today to say thank you, to thank you for getting here safely. Lord, there were accidents on the highway due to the rain, but you allowed us to make it here safely and on time. And we thank you for this day, for this is the day that you have made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. We're not going to be sluggish. Uh, we're not going to be aloof, but we're going to be focused and tapped into your anointing and to your word. And so, Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts and minds. Remind us of all of your great and exceeding promises that you have given to us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would help us, Lord, to trust in you, to hope in you, to continue to fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, that we may give your name honor, glory, and praise. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. So we are still in our series, The People of the Promise. People of the Promise, that's y'all. <laughs> and today, we're gonna to talk about the promises of God in the Old Testament. Uh, you all know I am working hard to make you love the Old Testament. Not just to be New Testament believers, but to be all Bible believers. And the Bible is the Old and New Testament. Jesus preached from the Old Testament. Paul, Peter, James, and John, Jude, they all preached and taught from the Old Testament because that's the only Bible they had. All right, come on. Uh, so wake up this morning. So we're going to jump into this. Richard, good to see you, my brother. Talking about the New Testament is the outworking of the Old Testament. The New Testament is the outworking of of the Old Testament. And Dr. Gleason Archer Jr., who is speaking about the relationship of the Old Testament to the New Testament, says this. You have it in your notes, and if you don't, those of you online, you can download the link uh, to the PDF right in the summary statement of our stream. But here's what he says. The New Testament writers viewed the entire Hebrew scriptures, that's the Old Testament, as a testimony to Jesus Christ, the perfect man who fulfilled all the law. The Old Testament demonstrates that Jesus and his church were providential, the embodiment of the purpose of God. The New Testament proves that the Hebrew scriptures or the Old Testament constituted a coherent and integrated organism focused on a single great theme and exhibiting a single program of redemption. So Dr. Archer says that the New Testament writers, from their perspective of the Old Testament, was, was the only testament, the only Bible at that time, viewed it as a comprehensive program of God, that all what we come to know as the 39 books of the Old Testament that we have is God's single, uniform, 
an intended plan to bring Jesus Christ to fulfill the requirements of the old covenant in order that he could establish the new covenant in the expression of the New Testament church. So, so here's what we mean. And I was listening to Dr. Erwin Lutzer coming to work today. Uh, and he was talking about all of these people who are trying to separate the God of the Old Testament from the God of the New Testament, which is what I've been trying to tell you that there are people who dislike the God that sent Israel into the land of Canaan to take that land. There are people who do not like how uh, God operated in the Old Testament, but they ignore that Jesus saying, I said I came to bring a sword. They ignore the book of Revelation where folk are thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. So there is no difference between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament because it's the same God. It's just like in our politics, people pick and choose what they want to see and hear and ignore. But God is gracious in the Old Testament. He's gracious in the New Testament. He punishes wickedness in the Old Testament and he will punish wickedness in the New Testament. There is no distinction or difference. And so Dr. Archer says that the New Testament only proves out what God had promised in the Old Testament. It was his plan to send a savior. It was his plan to make out of two people, one new humanity. Out of the Jews and Gentiles to make one new humanity in Christ, it was always his plan. And that's why, for those of you who've been around church for any number of years, you've always heard that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So they're one and the same. One is just the box, the other is it unwrapped. <laughs> that, that, that's all it is. There's something good for you in here, and Jesus unwraps it. And, oh, that's what you had planned. All right, are you with me so far, Johnny Jackson? I see you, Paul Wiltz, I see you. All right, so we got a lot of work to do. I don't know how we're going to do it, but just pray my strength in the Lord. So point number two, God promised to keep the trusting mind at peace. So we're going to look at some promises in the Old Testament, a whole bunch of them, but we're only going to look at a couple, uh, well, several, I should say. All right, God promised to keep the trusting mind at peace. Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep him or her in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he or she trusts in you. Pause, that's what the indents are for. So he says, this is Isaiah speaking to God about what God has committed to do for his people. And Isaiah says to God that you will keep the person mine in perfect peace. Now, that phrase, perfect peace, is really peaceful peace. It's, it's God, the author, doubling up on the word but they understood the translators who give this to us understood that it was emphasizing the peace and so they say perfect peace but it's really you will keep their mind in perfect in peaceful peace or in peace peace it's the word say it twice so they just say perfect peace whose what mind has stayed on you that word stayed actually means I can move today. I got two cameras, praise the Lord. That means that you lean on, right? You, you rest on. So he's saying that there are some situations that happen in our lives that cause us to have unstable thinking. And so my mind needs to be at peace. And the only way I can maintain peaceful peace <laughs> is if my mind leans on Jesus or on the Lord. This is the Old Testament. It leans on the Lord. 
In other words, either my mind can lean on me and I'm staying up all night, can't get no rest, can't enjoy my steak, says the girl. I, I, I can't enjoy my friends and my family. I can't enjoy my job because I'm worried about this and worried about that. Or I can take my mind and I can lean it on Jesus. I can lean it on the Lord. And if I give him my mind, then my mind will be at peace because I'm not trying to figure out how I'm going to get out of this situation. I'm saying, all right, I'm going to give it to the Lord. And so my mind is going to be stayed on, on him. You take it. I'm, I'm not going to keep this. You take it. So it's, it's stayed on him. In other words, he's going to carry, Frank, my mind. And the reason I'm going to be at perfect peace and give him my mind, he says in another way, because that person trusts in the Lord. See, when I give my mind to Jesus, as the songwriter says, I stop worrying about it, right? <laughs> I turned it over to the, to the Lord. That, that, that's a, a song that just quoted this verse right here. So, Isaiah 26, 3 is, I turned it over to the Lord and he worked it out. Oh, yeah. And, and so I trust Lord. Because if I'm trying to regulate my mind, it means I don't trust God to regulate it. And I see how that is because I'm getting two hours of sleep. I'm up all night, I fall asleep at three and I wake up at five because my alarm clock went off. And that ain't gonna work for me. Now it might work for you, maybe you can make it off two hours of sleep, but I need a good seven at least. And, and so I, I can't hold my mind, I gotta stand on the Lord. Verse four. So now this is his exhortation to us. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah, which is short for Yahweh, then he says, the Lord is everlasting strength. So he's talking to God, you will keep the person's mind in perfect peace, whose mind has stayed on you because they trust in you. Then he turns to us and say, trust in the Lord. <laughs> trust in the Lord Sometimes, Tr trust in the Lord when it's looking good. <laughs> trust in the Lord when you feel like it's gonna be okay. It said trust in the Lord, come on forever church focus right there in your paper. <laughs> trust in the Lord forever. So there should never be a second, a millisecond in my life that I don't trust in the Lord. Why, he tells me, because in the Lord is everlasting strength. So I trust forever because he has strength forever. In, in, in other words, there's never a time where he don't have strength. <laughs> you know, well, well, you know, God got getting recharged. You know, his battery ran out. So Isaac, if you hold on for five hours, God will be back up and running. He just plugged into the, the station uh, with the Teslas. And as soon as he get his, his EV charged back up, you'll be good. Just hang in there. No, he says everlasting strength is NG with the Lord. All right. Number three, God promised strength to those who trust in him. God promised strength to those who trust in him. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27. Here's what he says. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, the same group of people, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Now, this is Isaiah prophesying to a people who have yet to experience this situation. He's prophesying in advance to people who are going to experience a promise, in, a problem in the future. So he's prophesying right now what's going to happen years later so that the people who find themselves in that predicament will read what Isaiah said. And here's what he says to those people 
who were taken to Babylonian captivity. This is who he's talking to. There was no Babylonian captivity in Isaiah's time. It came later. But he's promising on behalf of God to a people who will find themselves in a situation. And he says, why y'all saying that God don't see? That my way is hidden, my problems, my circumstances, that, that my issue, my grievance is past God by. Now see what we must understand, because we call it the Middle East today, but you read certain nerdy books, they call it the ancient Near East. In the ancient Near Eastern culture, they believed that there were many gods. We know that, we see that in our Bible. And they believed that those gods had limited jurisdiction. This is like the law enforcement. The Chicago police can't go into Cicero and start uh, arresting people because it's outside of their jurisdiction. They have to be invited over, given permission over, and then they can operate. So the people that day thought the gods were like that. All right, this is the God of Israel, but he can't operate outside of Israel. This is the God uh, of, of the Philistines. And so Dagon can only operate in those five city states. He, he can't do nothing in Egypt. He can't do nothing in, in Ethiopia. But, and so the people who were in Babylonian captivity said, well, God don't see us because <laughs> he in Israel. We're crying out, but we can't get justice because the God that we serve is the God who rules over the territory of Judah. But here we are 900 miles away in Chaldea in Babylon. And so God can't see what we're going through. And that's how some of us feel when we're going through situations and difficulties. And we say, man, God don't see. <laughs> God, God don't care. But, but Isaiah said, what y'all talking about? Why you saying, why you saying God don't see? Why you saying God ain't giving you no justice? Let's look, verse 28, Sister Yogi, have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. So he asked them, why y'all saying this? Then he say, don't y'all know? Not don't y'all know, don't y'all know. Don't y'all know? Ain't nobody told you? <laughs> Have you not heard? First of all, he's the everlasting God. That's the first thing you need to know, that the God you serve was here before you and he will be here after you. That, that, that's the first thing you need to say. Then he wants them to get the record straight. He is the creator of the what? Ends. So, so the ends of the earth mean from one end to the other. In other words, God just ain't limited to Israel, to the boundaries, you know, from the Mediterranean Sea to, to uh, the, the, the Red Sea. He, he's not contained in borders. He is the God, the creator. So first he made all that's here and he has jurisdiction over all of it. So it's not like I'm in California, y'all here, so y'all can't see what's happening to me. No, God is everywhere. So, so I need y'all to get that straight. And he don't get tired. <laughs> he don't get weak. He don't get weary. And his wisdom, you can't even unravel. So all of these questions about does God see, does God care, is God going to give me justice, Isaiah said, y'all better stop all that. Kill all that noise. Stop all that bumping in your gums because I ain't trying to hear that. That's, that's what Isaiah saying. You can't even fathom the level of God's cognition, the massiveness of his mind. He says he gives power to the weak. Now I got a question. 
I got a question. I want to do Uncle Shea. Uh, Ken, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. For those of you who watch Nightcap, if not, don't worry about it. I ain't talking to you. He says, he says that God gives power to the weak. So my question to you is, if God gives power, then that means God has power. <laughs> All right, help, help me out, class. Because how can you give what you don't have? Because when your cousins be out there in front of the gas station saying, can you got some change, and you ain't got nothing in your pocket, I ain't got it. So if you need power, Isaiah saying, God can, he can give it to you. And if you have no strength, guess what? He can increase that for you as well. Verse number 30, even the youths, even the youths shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So here's what he's saying. He said, now I want y'all to understand that. Some of y'all might be closer to 100. Some of y'all might be closer to 90. Some of y'all might be closer to 80, closer to 70, 60, 50, 40s, even the 40s. You start feeling kinks and pains and nooks and crannies. He says, but here's what I want you to know. Even them young bucks, they gonna eventually run out of gas. They gonna eventually get tired. But those people, no matter what your age is, no matter if you ran the Chicago Marathon like Deacon Knuckles did on this past Sunday or not, <laughs> they that wait on the Lord. So all I got to do is wait. Come on, church. All I have to do when I'm tired is wait. He didn't tell me to run. He didn't tell me to walk. He didn't tell me to jog or to trot or to hitch a ride. He told me when I'm tired, wait. Because when I run out of gas, when I run out of fumes, desperation sets in. Now I'm desperate and I start making goofy decisions. I start making dumb decisions because now I'm acting and reacting out of desperation instead of just waiting. And if I wait on the Lord, then he's going to renew. He's going to recharge. <laughs> he's going to refuel. He's going to replenish. He's going to restore what? My strength because that's what I've ran out of. And then once he gives me my strength back, he says that some of us gonna mount up with wings as eagles. Some of us gonna run and not go tired. Some of us gonna walk and not faint. Now, now one commentary I read gave me a new perspective on this. Because if I grow wings, I get there quicker. If I run, I get there quickly. <laughs> but if I walk, that's when I need the greatest endurance. Because wings take me on its own. Running, y'all quiet, gives me some effort and input. But if I'm walking, that means I got a long haul ahead of me. And so it's the walking that I'm not going to faint because they got a 900-mile journey from Babylon back home to where they lived and were taken from. And so God will help you in the journey if you stay focused on him. All right, y'all quiet today. I, I thought y'all going to be tearing the church up. All right. Number four, God promised never to leave or forsake his people. 
Brenda, that's like, we gotta wait, we gotta wait. God promised never to leave or forsake his people. Deuteronomy 31, six. And this is Moses talking to the children of Israel. He says, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Now remember, these are a bunch of folk, a big old family. They not yet a nation, because to have a nation, you gotta have people, law, and land. You got people, you got law, but they didn't yet have the land. They going over there to get their land, but it's giants in the land. It's nations that have fought, in some instances, centuries of wars. They know war. They have fortified cities. They have chariots, okay, with a group of people who were former slaves. And so Moses is saying to them on behalf of the Lord, don't be scared. Be strong and of good courage. You gotta be strong, cause you gonna see giants. But you gotta be of good courage. You gonna see massive armies with the best armor. And they're going to have military alignments and, and, and formations and arrays, and they're going to have the latest technology and equipment, night vision goggles. I know they didn't have it. I'm embellishing, all right? They got all that stuff. But here's what he wants them to remember. Don't be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. See, ignore all that other stuff. I'm going with y'all. That, that's all you need to know is that when you cross that Jericho River, that Jordan River, I'm going with you. So don't matter. Don't matter who's over there. Don't matter how many of them are over there because what you see is designed to create fear and intimidate you to give up the fight without even trying. Not knowing you could get lucky. You could close your eyes and get a lucky shot in by accident. You, you don't know, right? <laughs> because the Lord is going with you. He will cause the wheels off the chariots to, to come off. He will drop boulders from the sky, right? He did, I know he did. That's a, now they don't know he gonna do all that. He will send hornets to sting them in the hind end. See, they don't know what God got planned. He's saying, just don't be scared by what you see because I am going with you. Y'all missing y'all shouts today. I'm at, I'm finding me a new church. Um, he said, I'm going with you and I'm not gonna leave you nor forsake you. See, this is the promise. I will not leave you when y'all start fighting. My mama ain't gonna call me home because I got babysit my little brother. I didn't leave you because I had to use the restroom. And, and, and y'all all laid out in the middle of the street. I'm not talking to y'all. He said, I will never leave you, nor will I abandon you. Forsake me and abandon you. I'm not going to say, yeah, y'all go get them. I'll be up there with y'all in a minute. Don't work like that. God said, I'm going with you. I'm not going to leave you and I'm not going to bail out on you. All I need for you is to be strong and of good courage and don't be scared. If you go forfeit the battle, then at least go over there and fight and give it a shot. If you lose, at least you say you tried. If you don't get the grant, at least you took the time to fill out the paperwork. If the treatment don't work, at least you gave it a shot. If the people don't hire you for the job, at least you applied for the position. 
All right, I had to bring it down. I was talking to my friend. I got to talk to y'all for a minute. You got to let them sit on the sideline for a little bit. So God is saying, I ain't going to bail out on you. I'm going to be with you in the midst of those situations, but there's certain things that are going to take place that are going to cause you to try to have fear. See, see, what we have to understand, and I talk to people all the time, no Elder Hayes, I know I shouldn't be feeling it, but that's why God tells us don't because there will be situations that's going to try to create it. And when you recognize it, that's when your courage got to kick in. When you recognize it, that's when you have to be strong because the situation is designed to create fear. But I'm going to remember that the Lord is with me. I'm going to remember that the Lord is not going to leave me nor forsake me so what? I'm going to press on. I'm going to see what the end's going to be. And even, Peter, if you start sinking, at least I can say I took some steps on water, ain't none of y'all do nothing. But sit back there and look goofy. At least I can say, I mean, I walked on water, but I stepped on water for a couple of steps, all right? If you don't want to call it a walk... I, I took some steps on some, on some water, and I can keep that as well. All right, number five, Sister Peggy, God promised to be with his people who are in trouble. God promised to be with his people who are in trouble. Isaiah 43, yeah, he hot today. Isaiah 43, verse 1 says, But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, same thing, fear not. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. <laughs> when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Pause for the calls. All right, now again. God talking to his people through Isaiah who going to be in trouble, not in trouble yet, but they're going to be in Babylon. And he says what Moses just said, what? Fear not. Fear not. There's a whole lot of fear not, so don't be afraid in the Bible, which lets me know that I'm always going to be battling the urge to experience and feel fear. The fear, when I go to the doctor and they tell me first thing gonna happen is fear I get that tax bill the first thing I'm gonna fear is fear how I'm gonna pay this right I'm gonna feel fear but brother Owens I saw you shouting on Sunday but I can't trip because he says fear not for I have redeemed you I purchased you and in this case he means I took you from Pharaoh when he brought them out of Egypt that is their redemption again the Old Testament setting us up for what Jesus is going to do for us spiritually that is a foreshadowing I redeemed you I took you all from Pharaoh and made you my people that's why he said I redeemed you I called you by name I named you you name what you own, <laughs> okay? I redeemed you, I purchased you with the blood of the lamb and with Pharaoh and his army because I drowned them in the sea, so I killed people for you. And I gave you your name. All right, y'all quiet today. Y'all need some coffee. All right, I called you by man, and then he, 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 he put some... He put some uh, some bass in his voice and said, you mine. You belong to me. Right? He, he put his arm around him and said, you mine. Right? This is what God is doing. Though. So, so who going to mess with you? Uh, who who, who going to mess with you mine? You, you got to see this. Now I can help you out now. I can help my cousins out anyway. You mine. Watch this. Therefore, because you are God's, when you pass through the water... That water is not going to overtake you. Otherwise, you ain't going to drown. We, so he noticed now, 
because situations will cause fear, right? I don't need to tell you not to be afraid if there's nothing to be afraid of. But when I see rising water, when I see rushing waves, now we got to figure out how we're going to handle this. And he's saying, don't be scared. You mine. I redeemed you. You belong to me. And when you go through the waters, they will not overflow you. And on the other extreme, when you walk through the fire, you're going to smell like Febreze. You, you're going to come out of there. Ain't going to be no smoke on you. No fire. You ain't, you ain't going to catch on fire because God's going to protect you. That's what he's saying. Verse 3, Sister Ruby, for I am the Lord your God. Put some respect on his name. The Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored. And I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. God is saying, now look, ain't nothing going to happen to you because I'm the Lord, your God. I'm bad. He, he's saying, I got street cred. Street cred, but street cred. In other words, all the nations know me. They know my reputation. They heard about what I did to Pharaoh. They heard what I did to Og of Bashan and Sihon of Heshbon. They heard what I did to Jericho. That's why Gibeon fake like they had come from a long way with fake moldy bread and all that stuff and lied to you all because they were afraid. And they tricked y'all into agreeing to be in a covenant with them and a treaty with them. So everybody know who I is. That's what he's saying. They know my name. And he's saying, I gave Egypt for a ransom. Now, some think that he's talking about uh, Cyrus and Persia, that for sending them back home, God allowed them to conquer Egypt and, and these Seba and all these other different places. But we know, I know personally, I can't tell you the story, that God will give people in your place. Uh huh. The police came because y'all acting like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. The police came because they was low on their quota, and they rounded up him, him, and skipped over you. That's God, that's God giving. <laughs> All right, because y'all acting brand new on me, acting brand new. That car ran the light. It was supposed to hit you, but it somehow hit somebody else's car, and you still don't know to this day. This is God, all right, at the church back, God giving people, God will give people in your place because you belong to him. And he is committed and obligated to protect you. So some people got fired and it should have been you. Some people got passed over and it should have been you. But because you belong to God, you're precious in his sight, You've been honored, <laughs> and he loves you. He says, no, you can't touch that. Verse 5, all right. Fear not, Sister Joyce Butler, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather them from the west. I will say to the north, give them up and to the south. Do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. So this is where you say, I'm calling them all back from wherever they're scattered to bring them back home because they are called by my name and I created them for my glory, for my press release, for my name to go viral. All right, number six. God promised a better future for people who are displaced. Sister Yolanda, God promised a better future for his people who are displaced. Jeremiah 29, 10 says, For thus, says the Lord, after 70 years are completed in Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you, 
and calls you to return to this place. Now, this is Jeremiah writing from Jerusalem, or Judah at least, to the folk who are now actually in Babylon. Isaiah, I've been talking about it. We've been reading him. Now, this is Jeremiah's day. And Jeremiah is writing to the folk who are in Babylon, who are being lied to by false prophets that, that God finna send y'all right back. And Jeremiah says, nope. Y'all got to be there 70 years. Y'all got to be there for a specific amount of time. Now, he's writing to a people who are displaced. And to be displaced means to be removed from a place, to be removed from your place. And I like this because we get distraught when we are moved from our place, our place of comfort, our place of security, uh, our, our place of ease, and comfort and so now they've been put in another place and they not coming back right away so the question is what do you do when you're in a place you don't want to be you all quiet a place emotionally a place mentally a place spiritually a place physically literally on your job whatever it is when you are displaced that's where we experience discomfort and here's what the Lord says to them. I will visit you to perform my word. So I'm making you a promise that I'm going to bring you back, but it ain't going to be right away. But I'm going to visit you. Now, for somebody to visit me means they're not where I am. They have to come to where I am in order to take me back to where I was. And so God is saying metaphorically to those of us who are in displaced positions that he is not going to leave you there permanently, right? You have to be there for a time and a season for a purpose, but he's going to come and visit you to perform his word, that's his promise, and he's going to bring you back the way you want to be. But you got to stay where you are right now in order for God to work his work. Verse 11, Sister Carolyn, for I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. In other words, I know what I got planned. And I preached this years, years, years ago that displacement is a part of the plan. Your displacement is a part of God's plan. You know why? Because if you'd have stayed in Judah, you was going to die by the sword. He said, go or die. So even though they were in a place they didn't want to be, had they stayed where they wanted to be, they would have died by the sword because those people were disobedient who didn't go to Babylon. Oh, it's quiet now, Lord. They don't want to talk to me now. They didn't want to go but the remnant was obedient to go to a place I didn't want to be because God says that's where he want me to be because where I wanted to stay would be worse. Ah, all right. So even where I don't want to be is better than where I do want to be because watch this, God has a plan, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give me a future and a hope. So my future is hopeful. My future is bright if I can wait on the Lord. And in his time, in his way, in his day, he'll bring me back to where I want to be, Sister Jacqueline. All right, let's go to number eight. My time getting away. I told you got a lot of work, a little time. All right, God promised to abundantly bless those who are obedient. God promised to abundantly bless those who are obedient. All right, Deuteronomy 28, uh, verb, beginning at verse one. And it says, if you indeed obey the Lord your God and are careful to observe all his commandments I am giving you today, the Lord your God will elevate you above all the nations of the earth. 
All these blessings will come to you in abundance if you obey the Lord your God. Now, let me speak to the nerds for one, one minute because I understand that this is given to ethnic Israel. Absolutely. I understand that these are land promises. These are covenant promises given to them. I also understand, as we read at the beginning, that Jesus has fulfilled the law and its requirements. Therefore, in Christ, Paul said, we read it last week, that the promises of God are yes and amen. And I'll go a little step further for the nerds, if you give me 30 more seconds. As dispensationalists, we do believe that God has a separate program for ethnic Israel and the church, yet we understand that again in Jesus all the promises of God are yes and amen and so we operate from a biblical hermeneutic of the theological principle of the text and so it still applies to us not literally but spiritually and so thus we can lay hold of the spiritual promises that are given to us in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Now back to you all. All right so Verse 1 begins, evangelist, with the word if, which makes it what? Conditional. There we go. I got a good class. Somebody knows the class. If means it's conditional. Right. That's the first thing. So we starting out with the word if. If you indeed obey. We got to obey, obey. Uh, um, if you obey the Lord your God and are careful to observe some, a few, 99.9%, all his commandments I'm giving you today. You see this? This is the trick. The Lord going to do what? He going to elevate you. So, so, so now, again, we're not under the law, as I told my nerdy friends. We're under grace. But the Old Testament still provides us theological principles that we can glean from. And so we're not looking to keep the law. We're operating in a spirit of obedience. All right. So what we're talking about, you and me, is a principle of walking in obedience, not walking in perfection, walking in obedience. All right. So if I walk in obedience, Barbara Murphy Dunn, God is going to elevate me. All right. That means he's going to lift me up to a higher position if I walk in a life, which is the same thing, of obedience, and all these blessings will come to me in abundance. So not only is he going to bless me if I live a life of obedience, but he's going to bless me in abundance. All right, y'all not excited. All right, verse number three. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the field. In other words, no matter where I am, I'll be blessed. See, going back to our previous passage in Jeremiah, what he went on to tell them, or earlier, uh, a few verses higher, is build houses, plant vineyards, get married. In other words, watch this. You're not where you want to be, but I'm going to bless you where I want you to be. He's saying to them, if you walk in obedience, verse 3, whether you're in the city or in the field, you're going to be blessed, right? Because my location doesn't determine my state of being, i.e. blessedness. My blessedness is based upon my obedience. Come on, you from 35th. You should have known that. When I walk in obedience, it doesn't matter where I am. I only get nervous when my life is raggedy. <laughs> See? See, if, wherever I am, I'm blessed because I know I'm in alignment and in agreement. I'll tap into the Women's Pray Weekend. Verse number four. Your children will be blessed as well as the produce of your soil the offspring of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks, your basket and your mixing bowl will be blessed. In other words, I'm going to make you productive and prosperous. That's what he's saying. 
because these, these herds, these flocks, these livestock, that was their money. That was their income. That was their wealth. They weren't carrying greenbacks back then, okay? That was their wealth. He's saying, I'm going to make you produce. I'm going to give you a large family. I'm going to give you generational blessings. And I'm going to give you generational wealth. If you walk in, all right, the church don't want to be obedient, Lord. Okay, verse number six, you will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. So, so I want you to understand this. Now, remember, these are not pick your blessings. This is blessing upon blessing that he is saying all these blessings will come on you and in abundance. I want you to remember this. All of these in abundance. Not just all of these. All of these in abundance will come on you. So even when you go out, you're going to be blessed. I'm just moving in blessings. Not just when I'm in the city or the field, but when I'm going to and fro. As I'm walking, I'm just walking in blessings. That's what he's saying. See, I'm, I'm just walking. All right, I'm walking. Sister Diane in blessings. All right, verse, verse number seven. The Lord will cause your enemies who attack you to be struck down before you. They will attack you from one direction, but flee from you in seven different directions. See, see this is why you ain't got to be scared. So I want to, for the holiness folk, walk in obedience. Because now the blessings are on me. The principle of the blessing is on me so that my enemies can't do nothing to me. So they're going to come one way, but they're going to scatter like roaches. You know what I'm saying? They're going to scatter away from me like roaches, and I ain't going to have to do nothing. Because it's the Lord will cause your enemies. I ain't got to do nothing but give me some popcorn uh, and a big gulp uh, smoothie. Uh, or slushy and watch God work. That's all I got to do is watch watch the, the Benny Hill cartoon uh, or run out. You know, they run like they did on Benny Hill. I know y'all saved. Y'all didn't watch Benny Hill. But uh, all right, verse 8, the Lord will decree blessing for you with respect to your barns and in everything you do. Yes, he will bless you in the land he has given you. Not only is he going to do all these things, but he's going to decree a blessing on you. See, the, these are the things he's going to do, but now he says he's going to also do an executive order to bless you. He's he going to write legislation to bless you, right? Y'all not shouting enough for me. I'm at the, I got to find some Pentecostal people around here. The blessing... We would do that. I'm gonna bless your barn. That's your bank account because they call them storehouses. That's where you stored your sur stored your surplus. Verse nine: The Lord will designate you as His holy people, just as He promised you, if you keep His commandments and obey Him. Then all the peoples of the earth will see that you belong to the Lord, and they're gonna put some respect on your name. So, so watch this now. Because I'm walking in obedience. That's the key, the if. You see, we shouting over the then, but we, we, we got to shout over the if first. If you obey, if you walk in in the principle of obedience, you get all these blessings in abundance, I'm going to designate you. No, you can't have that seat. That's, that's for Isaac. See, see, that's what designate means. That your name is on there. It's a post-it note, a sticky note, a reserve sign, Whatever, who table is that? It ain't yours, don't worry about it. That's, that, that's all you need to know. I'm gonna designate you as holy people. As I promised you, since we're talking about people of the promise, if you keep the commandments, obey him, and everybody gonna be looking at you hating. That's what he said. They gonna see you, that you belong to the Lord, and they gonna put some respect on your name. They gonna see you blessed. And all it required was obedience. See, it's God did the stuff that people will respect you for. Oh, that's good right there. That's a shout. People are going to see the blessings on you 
and they're going to respect you, but you understand it's because I walk in obedience. You see what I'm saying? I, I don't want you to miss the point of the obedience. It's a whole lot of blessings, but it's my obedience to God that opens up this principle of alignment. So what's the big idea? I'm, I'm going to give you all a break today. We just don't have time. What's the big idea? The promises of God in the Old Testament are his guarantee to protect us and prosper us in return for our faithful obedience to him. Promises of God in the Old Testament is his guarantee to protect us and prosper us. That's what I want you to walk away with. It's his promise to you to protect you and to cause you to prosper. And by prosperity, we mean to be successful on your level. 10, 30, 60, 100 fold. He gave one, one, he gave one, two, he gave one, five. According to their ability. So we ball on our level. That's our principle. We ball on our level. But I can prosper at the level I'm on. So somebody prospering, may be a nice apartment, but I'm good. I got a retirement account. Somebody else may be a house with two, three cars. Somebody else may be a mansion. Somebody else may be, you know, houses in Maui and New York City and California and got your own island, but I'm going to prosper on my level. And I'm going to be protected on my level. All right, y'all quiet now because y'all want the house in Maui. I, I get it. I understand. How, how are you holding up, the question, how are you holding up your end of your relationship with God? That's why I skipped over the tithing thing. I wanted to mess with you because people getting in trouble on the internet about tithing, and I want them to pick on me too because I was going to really make them mad about tithing, but I'll get them another day. How are you handling, holding up your end of your relationship? See, Salvation is trust and grace. Blessings are if then. If you, then I. <laughs> if you, then I. So how are you holding up your end of your relationship? You got quiet now. We're going to have to go get them prayer rooms back from Saturday. How are you holding up your end? See, it's good when Hezekiah could go to God and say, I've been faithful. He got the 15 years because he had something to negotiate with. What you got to negotiate with God with? Can you go to God and say, Lord, the prophet said, I got to get my affairs in order. I got to go see my attorney to make sure my will tight, my trust is right because I'm finna die. And you say, but Lord, I've been faithful. I reopened the temple. I cleaned all that stuff out of there my father put in your temple. I, I reinstituted uh, the Passover. I, 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 I did all of that stuff. All right, 15 more. You got something to negotiate with. What you got to negotiate with God with? All right, here's a challenge. Let you be. Lay hold of God's promises in the Old Testament and live out your responsibility to be holy in an unrighteous culture. That's the thing. You got to live holy in an unholy, unrighteous culture. Holy means other, different. And the problem is we're trying to fit in when we're supposed to fit out. Say that again. Because folk trying to change the church. Folk talking about the church, too holy. The church, too religious. Church, too for, uh, focused on morals and ethics. As a pastor say, the church needs to be more relevant. But we are called to fit out, not to fit in. That's why we're called to be holy. So make sure that you want these blessings. 
And you got the greatest one of all, because Paul says we have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. You're saved on your way to heaven, and you're so glad. You're going to ball out in the new Jerusalem, in the new heaven, new earth. So we're we going to be kicking it hard in, in, in the by and by on this earth, but in the struggle, in the wait. We got to live a life of obedience because we are proving our worth for the rewards that are yet to come. And there may be someone here who has not given their life to Jesus, and we want you to give him your life, to put your trust and confidence and faith in him for your soul. We talked about protection. We talked about prosperity. Uh, we talked about our minds being at peace. The greatest way, the only way to have all of these things is to be in Christ because Christ fulfilled and perfectly obeyed all of the rules and regulations that you and I could never keep. We would do good to do 30% of them consistently, faithfully. But in Jesus, who kept them all, God gives us credit for his perfection. And when we put our trust in Jesus to save us from our sins, then we receive his Holy Spirit. And it's the Spirit of God that gives us the ability to obey God, to live faithfully, to live in obedience, to walk upright before God, not so we can get blessings, but because we're already blessed, because we're on our way to heaven, because we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, because our calling and election is sure and secure. And so because of that, we live godly, we live holy, we live in obedience because it's the debt we owe. It's the debt we owe, not to get to heaven, but because we're already on our way to heaven. If you're here today, you've not given your life to Jesus, just get up out of your seat, come on down the aisle, don't wait another moment, don't wait another hour, don't wait another day. And for those of you who are studying God's word online, you need Jesus in your life too. We read some wonderful promises from the Old Testament given to the children of Israel. But because Jesus made it possible for us to also be partakers of the spiritual blessings that God has promised them, we can also have a better quality of life. Because Jesus says, I've come that you might have spiritual life and that you might enjoy the blessings and material health benefits and blessings that come with being in relationship with God through me. And so if you want to put your trust in Jesus, if you want to give your life to him because you believe that he is God's son coming to this world to die for our sins, who was raised from the dead on the third day and lives forevermore, then let us know that you trust him, that you believe in him, that you want to give your life to him, and we're going to call you and we're gonna begin this journey with you. Let us pray. Father, we come today to give you honor, glory, and thanks for all that you have done. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the promises of the Old Testament. For were it not for the Old Testament, there would be no New Testament. It's your Old Testament that promised the Messiah. It's the Old Testament that promised our redemption. It's the Old Testament that promised a new heaven and a new earth. It's the Old Testament that promised that your son would reign forevermore on the throne of David and that he would bring in those who were not a part of the nation of Israel, the Gentiles, and that together we would worship you for the rest of eternity. And so, Lord, we thank you for these souls that have given their lives to you. And we pray that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit as you have promised. And we'll give your name the honor, the glory, and the praise. And we thank you for it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise.